Okay, hello everyone. We are starting uh, our CMSA colloquium. Today, we are very happy to have uh, uh, Sisa Shadri as our chair. He works on the intersection of theoretical computer science and data mining. Uh, Sashadri has uh, got his PhD from Princeton and he is currently based in California, in the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, today, uh, Sashadri will talk, uh, will tell us about the impossibility of low dimensional embeddings uh, for to capture important features of real world data. Sashadri, uh, take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Sergey. Thank you all for joining. And uh, you know, please feel free to ask questions, interrupt me at any point. Uh, as in, you know, um, I don't have to finish all my slides. I'm happy to take questions at, at all times at any point. Um, uh, and so, am I audible? And can everyone see the screen? Everything is good. Yes. Yes. Uh, excellent. Uh, so today, I'll be talking about studying the ineffectiveness of uh, graph embeddings. Uh, somewhat of a controversial topic in some ways. So I, I will take some a fair amount of time trying to sort of set up the problem and explain to you, you know, how we actually arrived at this question. Uh, so firstly, you know, on the importance of networks or graphs, uh, which are a very important way of representing data. You have, you know, social networks, you have the web, you have computer networks. And so essentially representing data as graphs is very important in you know in the current world in data science, but you know presumably maybe you already knew that. So this is sort of a cursory slide on studying these, and the classic case would be social networks, which is useful to have as the kind of archetype graph that we're interested in. Now, when you have such a graph, what you will often people want to do is machine learning on these graphs, and so the ML on this graph certainly you know you have data, which is the graph, and then you have various tasks you want to perform. Community detection, link prediction, content recommendation, attribute prediction, there are many different tasks that you want to perform on this graph, which is this data. And here I have uh, five individuals uh, that uh, you may recognize. Well, okay, that's just me. That's Paul Erdish, uh, Leonard Euler, uh, our Vice President Kamala Harris, and this is uh, Lady Ada Lovelace. So anyway, so this is some you know toy social network here that I've drawn, and so sorry. So how does one actually do ML on graph? So often you'll have some ML pipeline. So the pipeline would be you have some complex machine learning machine here, it's ML machine here, which might take as input two individuals or maybe more or maybe one and provide some result, maybe link prediction, recommendation, you know, all kinds of different tasks. And uh, you'll see these individuals often have features associated with them. You know, me, you know, I have a gender, I have a location, I have various other things. And one of the questions is how does one incorporate the graph structure into the machine learning task? Is there a convenient representation of vertices? And I put these in quotes because you know, there may not be one right answer for these questions. And to solve this problem or to address this question, in comes a technique called graph embeddings. So what does graph embeddings do? It takes in a graph. So let's just think of this as maybe just some you know, vanilla undirected simple graph. A graph embedding will construct a vector for each vertex in some low dimensional space. So here are these five individuals here in this graph, which have been converted into you know, have been put in geometric space. So for each individual, there is a vector or there's some coordinates. And what you like is proximity in the graph to be roughly the same as proximity in this geometric space. Now these are terms, you know, which are, um, which are not well defined. So maybe you could say that an edge in the graph corresponds with some kind of geometric closeness over here. Sometimes it might be more than an edge, but essentially, as long as you have some measure of proximity in the graph and you have some measure of proximity in your space, then you want these to be related. What you want to do, you know, from a mathematical standpoint is to convert the topology into some geometry where the dimension D is much, much smaller than N. 
N is the number of vertices in the graph, the number of individuals that you're interested in, D is the dimension of the space. So this is what a graph embedding method does. You know, if you strip away all the jargon and everything, it takes a graph and it spits out and it outputs a collection of vectors, typically in low dimensional space. The promise of graph embeddings is that now this is a convenient task independent representation. Because for every individual, I end up with a vector. And I can now feed this vector directly as features into my pipeline. And this is why you know, many practitioners really like graph embeddings because it doesn't depend on what task I want to do. I get this vector and I can feed this vector into my pipeline. So I can replace you know, me and I basically can feed in a vector instead, or as I like to pithily call it, I am not a person now, I am D numbers. I can replace every individual with D numbers. I feed these numbers into my complex ML machine and, it's e and then you know, I can essentially incorporate the graph structure. And it's important that D is much smaller than N. So it's, this is efficient to add into my pipeline. So for example, maybe N is like a million or many hundreds of millions or maybe more. And my dimension would be something like 128, 64, 128, maybe a thousand, but not much more than that. And it's important that this dimension D is much, much smaller than N. So it's a low dimensional graph embedding. And so there's been a massive industry of methods on this in the past few years. Of course, many of you will probably say, but you know, SVD, is essentially some kind of an embedding method. So I've put SVD in red. There are lots of different methods, Laplacian eigenmaps, Grarep, Line Hope. Famous ones are DeepWalk, Note to Vec, and GraphSage, which have emerged in the past, maybe you know, five or six years. There's much literature. I'm just pointing out a very nice survey of Hamilton, Ying, and Leskovic from 2018, which is probably already getting dated. And there are many, many methods which are there to construct these graph embeddings. Um, and, you know, I, there's a vast literature and I don't claim to even know, I don't even claim to know half of it. So I've put in some names here, although I may have missed many other methods. Some of the important ones that I will point out are, of course, DeepWalk and Note to Vec, which have been fairly influential in the development of this area. For those of you who, uh, who maybe have an optimization background, you're probably looking at this and saying, but you know, this is just low rank factorization because what I could do is I represent my graph as an adjacency matrix, or maybe I take some appropriate matrix here, maybe not just the adjacency matrix, a random walk matrix, some matrix that represents proximity. And then I want a low rank factorization as V transpose V. So I'm thinking of my uh, matrix V as sort of you know, uh, short and fat. So each column is a vector and V transpose V is the gram matrix. And so all the dot products over here, basically you know, that would be my gram matrix. And then this is essentially a low rank factorization for which of course it's a massive history. And the idea is that graph machine learning can piggyback on advances now, what does this approximate mean? Well, pick your poison. There are many different kernels or many different methods that you want to, that you could possibly use for this. And indeed, then the embedding becomes an optimization problem. And now we have an algorithmic toolkit. Many of the examples of methods I showed you in the past are basically factorization methods where this approximately equal is defined in various different ways. And this matrix M would be defined in various different ways. But fundamentally, this encompasses a fairly large class of methods that are used. Uh, any questions at this point about you know, what I'm talking about? These are graph embedding methods. I'll pause and take any questions that you have at this point. All right. So now that we have these factorization methods, you could ask, do these graph embeddings, do they actually work? And this is a much more difficult question to pin down. So one way, and this is typically the way that most of the evaluations are done in the literature is, well, you have some downstream tasks that you have in mind, like link prediction, community labeling, 
you know, there are many different tasks that you may have in mind. Maybe you want to do some kind of recommendation, who should, who's similar to whom, various things. And instead of me getting into what those are, let's just say abstractly, you have some downstream tasks that you want to do. And then what you can do is you can evaluate that downstream task with the embeddings. Now, in most experimental methods in these papers, the embedding methods are often compared with each other. So sure, one embedding method may improve over previous embedding methods, but that doesn't really address the question is, does the embedding technique actually work? Anecdotally, if you talk to practitioners, they'll say that adding vectors to the pipeline helps. But to me, it's like, sure, you know, you add more information and yes, it will help. There is some information there, but do you really need the embeddings? Is it an artifact of the embeddings? Is there something else that is there? And th there was a paper uh, not too long ago by Gurukar et al. Uh, it was from Srini Parthasarathy's group at Ohio State who said that you can often beat embeddings using hand-tuned features. Meaning that if you have a particular task in mind, you can come up with features that beat embeddings. The people who are proponents of embeddings will say, but no, but you see this, we are giving you something that is task independent. So admittedly there is, you know, this doesn't say that embeddings don't work, but it is saying that, you know, they may not be the silver bullet that, that is, often, um, that is often suggested. And so this is the question that we wanted to address. And it was very hard to pin this question down. What we wanted to say is, on the one hand, graph embeddings are proposed as, an, as a task independent representation. On the other hand, the evaluations happen to depend on the tasks themselves. Of course, they do many different tasks, but it seemed like, you know, is, we weren't really getting to the core question. So let's try to sort of dig a little deeper here. If you look at any graph embeddings paper, especially the classic ones, you'll see buried inside the paper, there is some assumption on the structure of social networks. It's usually some modeling assumption. So, I'm a, you know, my training is in theoretical computer science and I'm an algorithms person. So the way I think of the world is you give me some data and I compute something on it. But from a statistician's perspective, they view it differently. They will say that the data that you get is really not the truth. That's just a manifestation of some model. And what you really want are model parameters. So from a statistician's viewpoint, they would say, and this is the viewpoint that is often used in many of these papers on graph embeddings, is really people are vectors in R to the D. They connect based on geometric proximity through some stochastic model. This is what yields the social network. So the social network is seen as an outcome or observations of some statistical model that you have. And then finding the graph embedding would be like finding the model, finding the modeling par model parameters. So you think of it as if you have a model in mind, a model where vectors create a graph, then finding the graph embedding is really, I have my outcome, which is my graph. And then I go ahead and try to find what the model parameters are using maximum likelihood or whatever, whatever have you. And this is usually the story that is given in many of the embedding papers. For example, just to give you a concrete description, they'll say that the geometry represents a space of a few interests. So for example, each individual maybe have, has a political affiliation they have some sports interests, they have some music interests. And so each person is a vector where they have these interests and edges are created by homophily, which means that if you have similar interests, you are more likely to join. This is often measured as dot product. So it's a very common measure to use dot product as a measure of similarity. And so we could say something like, given a bunch of vectors, an edge will form with probability either the dot product itself or some function of the dot product, let's say proportional to the dot product. And you know, this yields the social network. And so now given the social network and given this model, you can try to find what the vectors are. And this is sort of where we wanted to get at, like, can we actually validate this assumption? Like, is this a valid assumption for social networks? Stepping back to the previous slide I have, I said like buried inside there is some assumption on the structure of the social network. Are these assumptions actually true? Right, and this was 
is essentially the starting point for the research I'm going to talk about. So before I tell you the results, let me give you an anecdote. And the reason why I say it's an anecdote is this is an experiment, but this isn't really a detailed scientific experiment, although it was very eye-opening for us. So what we took is we took a citation network from DBLP. So this is a data set that's publicly available. So this is 3 million papers. Each vertex is a paper and each edge is a citation relationship. So make it undirected. So 3 million vertices, 8 million edges. And what we're going to do is we're going to start from a paper. And this paper is called On Privacy Preserving HCI Issues. So it's a mix of HCI and security. And we found a cluster around that vertex through some diffusion process. Specifically, we use personalized page rank. It isn't exactly important what this is. Just think of it as you started a vertex and you're trying to find some kind of community around this vertex. So here's a picture of what we got. Okay, so let me tell you what this is. The green node over here is the vertex we started from the source. We found this cluster around this through a standard diffusion process. We colored the nodes as blue or red. Blue means that it's relevant. Like we actually looked at the title and we saw that the title has some relevance. So you'll see that we put a keyword from the title. Many of these are on authentication, are on password, which is related to privacy preserving HCI issues. There were two papers that in this cluster that we were not able to determine as relevant just based on the title, although maybe they were, you know, so this is, but this is the cluster that we got. It's some kind of fairly dense component. And I put this over here to show you the graph is overall extremely sparse, 3 million vertices, 8 million edges. On the other hand, the cluster around this vertex is highly dense. And this is what you expect from a social network. So there are no surprises over here. Any questions about what, what this is, what I did over here? Okay, now what we're going to do is we're gonna take our graph, take the adjacency matrix of the graph, take a hundred dimensional SVD. Again, a classic method. I have a, I have a question to the previous slide. Yes. Uh, when you, um, could it be uh, the case that uh, the reason that you identify the density connected to the cluster is exactly because these are the ones that are easier to be identified by the method you used. So it has nothing that much about the structure of the graph. True. Like, so one can get into, you know, whether this is an artifact of the process that we use, or is this really something fundamental in the graph? And I, I, I agree. That's why I said this is sort of an anecdote. Yeah. I won't, but, you know, when you look at the titles, you get information that's relevant. To us, to some extent, the validation that this is something useful is if you look at the titles of the graph, the titles of the vertices, they seem like they were relevant to this topic. Furthermore, if you look at the actual component, it's quite dense. You look at the, the number of edges in this graph, the density of this component is much higher than the ambient density of the graph, which is tiny. And uh, again, personal, you know, one can get into discussions of whether personalized page rank is the best way to do it, but it's, it's a reasonably established method to use to find clusters around a vertex. Okay, so here's, here's what we're going to do. We're gonna take our graph, take the adjacency matrix, take a hundred dimensional SVD, okay? And so, you know, ignoring the intricacies or under, you know, what SVD is doing, essentially what you get is a hundred dimensional vector for each paper. For each paper, you get a hundred dimensional vector. So here is your hundred dimensional vectors, one vector for each paper. And now following what many of these models do, we're gonna construct a new graph where we're just gonna add an edge probability with probability proportional to the dot product, which is in this case, exactly the dot product. And if the dot product is not between zero and one, just truncate to zero and one. Again, sort of a standard mechanism to you. So we're gonna, so we're gonna take our uh, graph and for every pair of vectors, which give two vertices, we are gonna add an edge with probability that is the dot product and we get a new graph G prime. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna again find a cluster from the same vertex in that graph. So you get some cluster. 
And we're just going to go back and see what that cluster looks like in the original graph. Okay, that's the experiment. This is a stochastic thing. So if essentially every time you do this, you'll get a different result. So I'm going to give you an example of one result and it's fairly consistent. And what we sort of were surprised to see is here's the cluster that we got from the same paper. And I've actually put the explicit titles over here. So firstly, what is interesting is whatever we got through this graph was an independent set in the original graph. Moreover, if you look at the titles, they seem to have no connection to privacy. They were all over the place. Like one of them was mechanisms for multi-unit auctions, lossless cond condensers and expanders, improved algorithms for clustering, a couple of papers on architecture, sort of all over the place. And you know, contrast this with the original cluster that we got. Now, of course, every time you did this, we got a different set, but they were all essentially had no connection whatsoever to the main topic when we're using a standard algorithm. So we use a standard algorithm on the original graph. We got a very relevant cluster. We ran the same algorithm on a hundred dimensional, on the model from a hundred dimensional SVD. And what essentially we got was very little information. And this was consistent over another example where we took another paper called key management and encrypting file systems. So this is something like cryptography and systems. This is what we got in the original graph, a dense cluster. When we find such a cluster in G prime, which is what we got from the model, from the low dimensional model, we go back in the original graph and we get something which is an independent set. Surprisingly, there were always independent sets. Like it wasn't even capturing an edge of the original graph and the topics were all over the place. Whereas when we look at the original cluster, they were all sort of on topic in, in cryptography or like, you know, systems and systems cryptography. And this is something that we consistently saw over many different runs. Again, I claim this is an anecdote or it's a collection of anecdotes because, you know, we didn't go into like measuring exactly the quality or running an extremely long, large experiment, but it was somewhat eye-opening to us that, you know, that there was so much that was missed by an SVD. I have a, I have a question. Um, yeah. For yeah. Um, about the <clears throat> setting of the problems, I think you said you have like, so you have, uh, so every vertex is an embedding in RD and then you find, and then the edges between the two vertices is the dot product, right? And so what if like the embedding somehow uh, results in like a vector that's very close to zero and on an L infinity norm is very close to zero. And so even though the two vertices, right? Like, I mean, are kind of close, the dot product would say it's not actually close, right? So that's, that's a good question. So you could say like, you should be normalizing by the length. So again, I didn't, I'll show you numbers later on, but in general, the lengths of the vectors are fairly reasonable. I see. So and I'll show you like data on this explicitly later on. The lengths of the vectors are quite reasonable. I see. Thanks. Yeah. Any uh, any other questions? Okay. So, how is the embedding missing so much? And we're using SVD now. Of course, SVD. You know, some might argue that SVD is not the best technique, but it is classic enough. And it was surprisingly not getting any information in any of these examples that we did. And so now that brings me to our results. Uh, what we can empiric empirically we show and we theoretically prove is that many popular low dimensional embedding methods fail to capture the important structure of real world networks. So there are two papers involved here. The first one uh, is with my co-authors Anish Sharma, Andrew Stolman, and uh, Ashish Goyal, we proved that dot product low rank models, which are the most com which are a very common class of models, cannot produce the triangle structure of real world networks. And then in a uh, follow up manuscript, uh, which also involves uh, K Caleb Levy, we proved that popular factorization based methods cannot produce communities and they perform poorly empirically on community labeling tasks. So. I want to point that this is sort of in contrast with a lot of the literature. So it is somewhat, um, you know, the claims maybe at some level are somewhat controversial. And so, you know, we give a theoretical justification of our results as well. 
So let me start with the first paper and let me tell you exactly what we prove formally. So the model that again, we, that I described, which is very common in the literature is you have n vectors. Uh, I'm sorry, you have n, yes, you have n vectors in d-dimensional space. And we're gonna put an edge with independent probability vi dot vj. Now, just to be precise, because vi dot vj might not be between zero and one, so it might not be a probability, we threshold it between zero and one. So this is the explicit formula used, but I prefer to use this picture. So the probability of an edge between i and j is a function of the dot product, and it's essentially the sort of truncated function. And you can also put a logistic function with constant parameters. You know, you can you can pick and choose. Uh, I'll come back to this logistic function case. It's a little tricky, but essentially anything with a slope that is a constant, any function with a constant slope would work over here. This is the model used by methods called Grarep, Hope. There's, it's sort of what's used in line. It's closely related to SVD because essentially you can think of these vectors are like a low rank eigen decomposition of a probability matrix, which is used to create the graph. This is very common model used when discussing social net, when, you know, in, in, in the graph embeddings literature when discussing social net. And uh, the question that we wanted to address is if D is significantly smaller than N, can this model generate approximations of real world networks? Okay. To formalize this, we'll say, let's look at the significance of triangles in the graph. So it is well established that real world networks have many triangles incident to low degree vertices. And I'll make this more precise in the next slide, but for now, let's just take these cartoon pictures. The triangle is just three vertices connected to each other. Typically what you have in a social network or in many real world networks like citation networks or co-authorship networks is you have an overall sparse graph with lots of dense blocks in there. These dense blocks contribute to many triangles. And that's why triangles are a convenient way of measuring community structure. Again, density here is the edges divided by vertices choose two, edges divided by the number of possible edges. So the density of a block or a subset is the number of edges in that subset divided by vertices choose two. Uh, these are often measured in a local way by something called a clustering coefficient. What is a clustering coefficient? Clustering coefficient is take a vertex and essentially measure the density of its neighborhood. Another way to think about this is the density of the neighborhood is precisely how often is this edge present between two neighbors? How often are two of my friends friends of each other? That is the clustering coefficient. By how often you can think of it as, so you take the number of triangles incident to this vertex divided by the number of uh, you know, neighbors choose two. And high clustering coefficients are used as some kind of measurable proxy for community structure. So just to show you some actual numbers, here are a collection of graphs, uh, common graphs that you can find uh, in social network analysis. The number of vertices, that's n, ranges from you know, 18,000 all the way to 3 million. And the number of edges you'll see is like about one order of magnitude more. So it's about 10 times, 10 to 100 times more than the number of vertices. Typically, it's a sparse graph. The average clustering coefficient of the graph is quite high, is like 0.1 or 0.2 or even higher. What I have plotted over here is the average cluster coefficient binned by degree. So this is in the AS Kitter graph. This is, a, um, uh, this is an autonomous systems network. For example, this is saying that if you look at degree 16 vertices, the average clustering coefficient of them is 0.25. Typically the clustering coefficient does decay as the, as the degree increases. But what you can see is in the low degree side, clustering coefficients are high. This is sort of a standard observation in, the, in network science, like it's probably about 20 years old and one repeatedly sees this. So what you see is there are many triangles incident to low degree vertices. So there are omega n, where n is the number of vertices. Omega n triangles incident to vertices of degree O of one, constant degree vertices. So here's the tension. Overall, the graph is sparse, right? M is not too far from N, maybe about a hundred times more. 
So the overall density is actually less than 0.0001. Actually, it's even smaller than that. It's like 10 to the minus five. That's the overall graph density. But the clustering coefficients are 0.1, which means that neighborhoods are dense, but overall the graph is sparse. If you pick two random vertices, they're not going to be connected to each other. That's what sparsity means. But if you pick two random neighbors of a vertex, they're highly likely to be connected. That's what clustering coefficient means. So there is a tension between the global sparsity and the local density. And what, we're what we prove is that you need high rank to resolve this tension. Essentially, this is a very crude way of putting it. I'm simplifying. It's a separate, you need a separate dimension for like every dense cluster and there are too many dense clusters. So the rank blows up. I wanna claim that this is in direct contradiction to low rank models of social networks. Any questions about this point? Okay, so now let me dig into a little bit of, of math here. Uh, I'm gonna measure it in, I'm gonna, I wanna measure the vertice, the number of triangles incident to low degree vertices in a specific way for convenience. I'm gonna define this quantity called delta of C. This is like a clustering coefficient. It's more convenient for analysis. Delta of C is the number of triangles contained amongst vertices of degree at most C. It should be at most C, I'm sorry here. So look at all the vertices of degree at most C, look at the induced graph and see how many triangles there are. Divide by N, that's delta C. Right, just normalized by the total number of vertices. So the delta C is the number of triangles contained among vertices of degree at most C. The number of triangles contained among low degree vertices. Typically, and I'll show you numbers, delta of 10 is like more than 0.1, which means that if you look at vertices of degree at most 10, they will contain N over 10 triangles where N is the total number of vertices. I am just dividing by N here. So typically for delta being delta of a constant is a constant. This is like the, the, the crude way of just like oversimplifying this is just saying that for C that is O of one, delta is omega of one. It's a linear number of triangles amongst constant degree vertices. And what we see is in what, again, this is consistent with all observations on social networks. This is a measure that we define for convenience in our analysis. And our main lower bound says the following. So if we use that model that we discussed earlier, so consider any n cross t matrix V, which means consider any set of vectors, any set of vectors, generate a graph according to the model with these vectors, right? Where you put an edge with independent probability VI dot VJ, or you can, um, you know, you could basically, uh, you, you, we would truncate it. And going back to the question of what are the vectors are too small? Well, you can go ahead and scale the vectors. So we're saying consider any matrix V. Suppose for C being O of one. So for some constant degree, the expected value of Delta C is Omega of one, which is what we expect in social networks. If this is the case, then the rank is at least N over log squared. N. So this is the bound that we prove. Recall that delta of C is the number of triangles, the sort of average is the average number of triangles present in the induced subgraph on vertices of degree at most C. So you're looking at all the vertices of degree at most C, looking at how many triangles there are just dividing by N. That is delta of C. So if there are at least a linear number of triangles in this portion, which is the vertices of degree at most C where C is a constant, and the rank is more than n over, rank is at least n over log squared n. Formally speaking, what we actually get is a statement that says that the rank is at least, you know, ignore this min, but is polynomial in the expectation of delta of c divided by c. So if both of these are constant, then essentially this, this coefficient term over here is a constant. So the rank is at least some is omega of n over log squared n. So this, I'm just giving you the formal statement here but the convenient statement for interpretation is what I haven't read. So this is what we prove. Any questions about this? I have a question, not yes. exactly about this, but so I think in your previous graph, um, you, there was like a, a bump. Uh, yes, 
Yeah, I'm trying to understand why that is. Yeah, so this is like some kind of, um, yeah, what, what, it seems that this could either be some kind of, this is a social network. This could be like a set of bots. They could be like a set of fake accounts that have all clustered amongst each other. That's probably what's happening over here. I see, I see. Yeah. But uh, the, the point is the low degree portion where you have non-bots all have high clustering coefficients as well. I see, I see. Right, what's imp you're absolutely right. Like this is somewhat anomalous, but you'll see this sort of decaying picture where typically it, go, it decays all the way is very common across all of these all of these graphs. I see. I see. And um, it's like sort of a a classic observation in network science regarding triangles. I see. Thanks. Questions. Okay. So I'll go ahead and proceed. And I also want to note, um, this is going back to you know some of the questions ra raised and some of the discussions, it doesn't matter how you choose this, this V, right? You use any method to get V, you still get a near linear lower bound. Right? This is sort of the main statement that we have. Um, and there have been papers that came after this, which proposed counterpoints where this lower bound can be circumvented. Uh, an interesting paper of Chanupriya et al. that came out, and I will discuss that, but let me now discuss this result before we go there. Let me talk about the empirical evaluation. So first, okay, so here's the theorem. I might spend a few slides talking about the proof of the theorem, but let me give you the empirical evaluation sort of justifying why this theorem is of relevance. So again, just like we did in our anecdote, but now we do it more scientifically, we start from our graph, we use an embedding algorithm, and we come up with some embedding. Now using this, you can construct a graph, a graph distribution where you can put an edge with this sort of truncated dot product probability. This is what our theorem talks about. But what we said is, okay, we, let's just train a model that predicts edges using dot products. We can train more sophisticated models. So we train, you know, like a logistic regression, you can do like a Hadamard product. There are more fancy models that we can train. Our theorem does not say anything about these, but empirically we can go ahead and evaluate them. Then we go ahead and from, we sample from the distribution, we get some G prime, which is a graph. And then we go ahead and plot C versus Delta C for many, many G prime. So we do like many experiments. We generate a hundred of these and we look at what the curve looks like and we compare the plot of C versus Delta C for the original graph. And we do this for different instances of a real data set G. That's, that's the experiment that we do. So here is example that I'll show. Uh, here are two example data sets that we have. So in blue, you are seeing the plot of C versus Delta C. That's for the original graph. And what you see in all of these other lines are various different models and various different ways of getting the vectors. So just to go back, there is an embedding algorithm and there is a particular graph model distribution. So you can pick this and you can pick this and you get a different plot. We take the maximum delta over 100 samples. So we're actually taking 100 samples and we compute the maximum delta for every single point here. So this is like, you know, this is statistically significant, the gap that we're getting here. And for SVD, we took like 100 dimensional SVD. We also took the output of node to vec and we applied various different models. Like we can look at the dot product, we look at logistic regression on the dot product, the Hadamard product, we use a bunch of different methods. And what we consistently see is this gap. So for small degree, for like degree 10, delta is like 10 to the 0.1. Degree 10, delta is 0.1. But for all the models that we get, delta is, is basically negligible. It's like 10 to the minus three, it's very small. So there is a large gap in getting the triangles at low degree vertices. What is interesting to note, as I've put in green, is that the total triangle count, which is what you get when you get the degree all the way to the end, the total triangle count is actually obtained fairly accurately. So this is saying that it's not that the models are getting nothing, they get the total triangle count, but they don't get the triangles incident to low degree vertices. They don't get those clustering coefficients. And so it's important for us, if you simply looked at the total triangle count, you'd say, yeah, the embeddings are doing what they're doing but they're missing all this local structure. 
the degree distributions also match. If you take the embedding, just take an SVD and you take the dot product, the, you get the degree distribution fairly accurately. So there is a match in the first order with the low dimensional model, but any higher order fails. And this is consistent across all the data sets that we, we experiment. Going even further, you, we, we show that you actually, I mean, we did this smaller example of the Facebook graph where it had 4,000 vertices and say, how, what is the dimension that you need to actually get this, get this up? You even need, like, even with rank 2000, it's sort of, it, it's still, there's, there's a significant gap. You need many, many, you need a very high dimension. This is, we were trying to say that like the rank is actually linear, although it's really hard to prove, it's really hard to empirically demonstrate this. So anyway, so this is, you know, this is less important. I think what is more important is really this picture over here. Any questions about this picture and what, what this is saying? Okay, so just looking at the time. So, um, so Sergey, we, we, when do we end? We end at seven? Or I'm sorry, at 10? So yeah, we have, have a, you have 17 more minutes. 17 more minutes. Okay, so I have, I have some, some time. So, so any, any questions at this point? I, I have a question, yes. <laughs> another one about like, uh, so uh, it seems that amongst all the different, I mean, SVD and N2V like variants, mm -hmm. the S, the end, the, the soft max versions seem to have like a very smooth um, type of curve. Mm -hmm. What exactly is happening with that compared to the other ones? I mean, I think that this is to some extent, this may be an artifact of the fact that the soft max actually has very high degree vertices. And also to some extent, there is some amount of fluctuation here because we're actually looking at the max over many iterations. So um, you can see that like sometimes if you look at some other data set, say like if you look at this one, then the red curve is actually reasonably smooth over here. Yeah. Whereas here, there seems to be more of a kink. Um, it's a good question. We don't completely understand what's going on with all of these. Um, and I guess we were really focused on saying that there's actually no action happening in the low degree regime. Any other questions? All right, uh, I'll proceed. And I'll just give you, you know, like a slight flavor of the proof. I don't want to get into too much detail on this. And so this theorem that basically proves that uh, the rank is at least n over log squared n. I'll just show you sort of what is the math that happens for the special case for all vectors of the same length L. Okay, so consider some sort of setting of vectors where all of them the same length L. And this is a triangle rich graph, meaning that C is O of one. And uh, let's just say that the expected value of delta C was at least one. Instead of it being omega of one, just make it one. It doesn't affect, it only affects the constants. And let's just say the graph has at most CN edges in expectation. So this is sparse. So the graph generated by these vectors has at most CN edges, it's sparse. And for C, which is some constant, the expected value of delta C is omega one. There are at least N triangles incident to vertices contained amongst vertices of degree at most C. So let's just assume these conditions and I'll prove the rank bound for you. So V again was our D cross N matrix, which was representing these vectors. So first thing we can argue is that if there are many triangles, then the length that L has to be large. So how do we do that? Well, pick a vertex whose expected degree is at most, at most C. What is the probability that this triangle is gonna form? Well, the probability of that triangle is just the probability that this edge forms. Now, the probability of the edge is that basically at most vi dot vj is at most the dot product, which by Cauchy-Schwarz is at most L squared. So just, you know, trivial bound by Cauchy-Schwarz, the probability of there being a triangle is at most L squared. Or, you know, L might even be less than one. We don't know what L is. L is just the length. It will prove a lower bound. 
Now the expected number of triangles that this vertex participates in is at most C square L square, just by doing linearity of expectation over all pairs. So it's actually C choose two L square. So if every triangle forms the probability at most L square and there are at most C square such triangles that can happen because it's expected degrees is at most C. Now I'm fudging some of the math here with the expectation, but you know, I'm saying the expectation of the square is the square of the expectation. You can work all of these things out and, you know, precisely. And so we said that expectation of delta C is omega of one. We said that the expected number of triangles that all degree C vertex, expected number of triangles among all degree C vertices is at least N. So what this is saying is if you were to sum this essentially over all the vertices in the graph, this should be at least N. Another way of saying this is, is C square L square has to be at least, essentially sort of at least one. That's how you get enough triangles. This is saying that if C square L square was significantly smaller than one, then a vertex of degree C would participate in less than one triangle. And that's just not, you know, that violates our assumption. So what you really get is that C square L square is at least one. So L is at least one over C. This is just saying that therefore the vectors have to be sufficiently long if you want to get triangles, which is not surprising given that you're using dot product. Right, so this is just sort of a very simple Cauchy-Schwarz argument. The more sophisticated part is to say, well, sparsity plus the fact that L is large is going to imply the rank is high. And this is going to be a bit of a trickier argument. So we're going to start with V. We'll take the gram matrix V transpose V. So you look at the diagonal entries here. Now the diagonal entries are just the norms of the vectors and all the vectors are the same norm L squared. The off diagonal entries are vi dot vj, right? This is a gram matrix. There's a, there's a lemma, and you can prove this lemma using Cauchy Schwartz on um, basically on, on, on the vector of eigenvalues. I'm just going to state this. This is like a, um, this is like, you know, something from uh, basic linear algebra that you can prove. Um, the rank is greater than or equal to the sum of squares of diagonal entries whole squared. So you take all these entries, which you know basically is the trace. It's the trace squared divided by the Frobenius norm squared. So you're looking at the trace squared. That's the sum of diagonal entries squared divided by the Frobenius norm squared, which is just the sum of squares of all entries. What we're going to show is that the numerator is large and the denominator is small, and therefore the rank is high. The numerator, we know exactly what it is because each entry in the diagonal is at least L squared. And so all of the work basically comes into bounding the denominator. So if vi dot vj was more than one, so if any of these individual dot products are more than one, then ij is an edge, right? That's because, you know, when the dot product is more than one, that probability, that probability is more than one and then it's just an edge. And there are at most C times N edges. So you can actually bound this using Cauchy-Schwarz and using this fact by C and L to the fourth. That's what you get in the denominator from the pairs whose dot product is more than one. When the dot product is less than one, well, then you can always upper bound the square by just at most the dot product. I mean, you have to take the absolute value here. So I'm fudging some of the calculations. And this is at most the probability of there being an edge. So when you sum up all of those squares, you basically, the total contribution of those pairs in the Frobenius norm where ij, where bi dot bj is less than one, the total contribution is at most the expected number of edges, technically twice that. So again, you get c times n. So if you plug everything in, in the numerator, you get n l square whole squared because there are n things in the diagonal. Each of them is l squared and you square all of that. So you get an extra n here versus the denominator. So if you're going to do the math over here, what you get is this expression n divided by c, one plus two divided by l to the fourth. Now this is where it gets interesting. If l was extremely small, then you would not get any lower bound. If l was extremely small, then the denominator would blow up. But from the previous slide, we actually have a lower bound on l. And so when you put this in, you basically get some kind of lower bound on the rank. You actually get a linear lower bound in this case. 
I should also say that this constraint of all vectors being the same length is actually used in practice. It's not an unreasonable um, assumption. So the general argument is more involved. Uh, I'll sort of skip over this. We have to use some kind of spherical packing lemma and there's some amount of work, but overall we get this lower bond on the rank. Now there are two counterpoints that one can have. The first counterpoint is, well, okay, fine. You use this for this dot product, but it doesn't capture other methods. There are many other more sophisticated kernels and models used like the softmax, steeper logistic functions, et cetera. And uh, two famous methods, DeepWalk and Notebook actually use different kernels. Most importantly, there was a paper recently, a very nice paper by Chanupriya, Musko, Tsurakakis and Sotiropoulos who designed a new embedding called LPCA, which avoids these lower bounds. So what they prove is that LPCA can embed triangle rich sparse graphs in low dimension. So I think it's very interesting that they have a different model that avoids our lower bounds. Interestingly, they show that you can actually embed any bounded degree graph in low dimension. So what is different from the previous results is they don't give a model of social that is specific to social network. They say, well, any graph can be embedded in low dimensional space using their method. So this is one of the arguments given as to why our result is not interesting, just to be direct. Like that's why I say, well, I don't care about this because of this. So my response to that is that dot product matters. Dot product is by far the most common model that is used and we need to understand its weakness. More importantly for me, the premise that social networks are formed by low dimensional vectors with edges by dot product, that premise is quite questionable. And that's sort of the main message that I want to give. I think SVD in general is a bad idea for task independent social network analysis. People do this in practice. And we need to understand that embeddings are not a silver bullet. And it's not just SVD, but many other models. If you're eventually gonna do predictions just based with dot product, that's a bad idea. The second argument, which is made against your paper as well, a practitioner says, I only care about the downstream machine learning applications. So what if you don't produce triangles? Who cares? I wanna do this for link prediction, community labeling or whatever. And the lower bound that we have says nothing about the impossibility on those tasks, which is an entirely valid point. My response to that is, but on the other hand, triangle structure is the fundamental hallmark of real world graphs. And if, if it's not able to capture that, then the downstream ML is probably working because of artifacts in the embedding that we need to understand. So from a scientific standpoint, I think it's really important that we understand, okay, if the embeddings are working despite this, then why are they working? But again, inspired by you know, many of these responses, we have a manuscript now where we're kind of dealing with this question more directly. So here we're actually looking at a particular downstream task, which is a binary prediction task. Do I and J belong to the same community? Take two vertices, do they belong to the same community? This is a common downstream task. And what we can prove is that popular factorization based methods cannot produce the kind of community structure that would be required to do well on this prediction task. So the specific task is I have two, two vertices. Are they in the same community or not? And a common, again, people use dot product or they use a more sophisticated kernel called the softmax. And uh, we show that it's impossible for these kernels for recreating communities. And this covers more popular methods like DeepWalk and Note to Vec, Line and, and GraRep. Um, again, what I will show you now is just an experiment, an experimental result. And then I'll end with that. So the experiment that we did is we constructed a stochastic block model. A stochastic block model is I have uh, 10 to the five vertices, so 100,000 vertices. I create communities of size 20. So I've created blocks of size 20. Within each block, an edge is put with probability 0.2. So this is dense within. Across the blocks, an edge is put with probability four divided by n. And four is again, just to ensure that the number of neighbors outside and the number of neighbors inside is basically the same. So it's a bunch of dense blocks that are all sparsely connected. This is like an archetype social network. Go ahead and construct the embeddings. And then what we're trying to see is given two vertices, are they in the same community? This is the, you know, the task we want to do. 
The score used for this is usually the dot product or the Hadamard product. So we say, okay, use whatever model you want. Let's take a vertex. Let's rank all the other vertices by their score and see how many are actually in its community, right? So let's look at the score. So this is like looking at the geometry now. Let's look at the score. And what we call precision at 10 is what fraction of the top 10 are actually in the same community? Top 10 neighbors in geometric space. And what we do is we plot the distribution of this quantity. Okay, and so what I've shown you here is the plots of these for an SPN. And we, this is what we call the reliability curve. So what is it saying? X on the X axis. So let's say you take, I'm um, sorry. So you take 0.5. This is saying, what is the fraction of nodes for which the precision at 10 is more than 0.5? Now, what you have in blue and green are two models, two popular embedding methods, NetMF and Notivec. What we have in red is just a very simple baseline that we use like personalized page rank and the cosine similarity of neighbors. Very standard features did a simple regression model, which predicts whether two vertices are in the same community. And there is a huge gap between the performance of a very simple baseline versus these methods which means that they're not able to get the community structure accurately of a very simplistic block model. So what we observe is, for example, in many of these methods, like 50% of the vertices have a precision less than 0.6, which means that they're, you know, many of their geometric near neighbors are actually not near neighbors in the graph itself. Whereas on the other hand, to predict the community structure is quite easy using a very simple regression model. And again, we saw this consistently amongst real data sets. Um, and uh, so I'm running out of time here. So I will just I'll skip over the math over here. Just end by saying that we need more theory in the study of graph embeddings. Right now, it's sort of very empirical, very much like you know an empirical people make do experiments and see whether these things work. I think we really need a study of the limitations of what is not possible. And we need to understand the power of different kinds of kernels. Um, and so with that, let me end. Thank you. Thank you, Sashadri, for a great talk. Um, we still have a little bit of time for one or two questions. Okay, looks like uh, uh, we already had questions during the talk and everybody who was super keen on clarifying things have already asked questions. Thank you very much uh, again, Sashad. Thank you, thank you very much for attending the talk. Thanks for the invitation. Right. Nice talk, thank you. Thank you.